Four Degrees to the Streets is designed to empower anyone curious about places and spaces, not just persons with professional degrees or backgrounds. Here we will cover a host of topics, including transportation, health, housing, and the environment through the lens of racism, classism, and sexism, and give listeners the tools they need to overcome institutional barriers. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at the number four degrees pod and tune in every other Tuesday where Nemo and Jazz keep it four degrees to the streets. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the four degrees to the streets podcast. It is season two. Happy fall, winter. We hope you guys all had a great summer. Um, hopefully you got to be somewhat outside. That was something we talked about last season. Um, but you know, the Delta variant came and changed that up a little bit. Um, Jasmine, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. It's not necessarily fall. It was like 80 or so degrees earlier in October. So glad that I bought these boots and I'm not going to get a chance to wear them until later in November. How are you doing? I'm well, I feel that I have some Doc Martin boots in my cart right now because I'm like, I'm, I'm, I want to dress. I'm ready to dress. I'm ready to layer, but I'm wearing shorts right now because it's still warm. Um, so today we are going to be talking about community engagement and how to do it um, from the perspective of if you're a resident, if you're visiting, if you work in a city or a town, um, but don't necessarily know how to get involved and you want to participate in the changes that affect you in your daily life. Um, Jasmine, how do you define community engagement or what are the, what are the streets saying about what, how to community engagement? So when I think of community engagement, I think of it literally engaging the community and that should be an ongoing process. It shouldn't be something that happens when you first have a proposal for an idea, but let's hear what the experts have to say. So the American Planning Association defines civic engagement. So civic engagement, community engagement, public engagement, all variations of the same words, um, as the process of working collaboratively with individuals and groups to achieve specific goals. Um, the CDC, the Center for, Center for Disease Control, defines community engagement as the process of working collaboratively with and through groups of people affiliated by geographic proximity, special interest, or similar situations to address issues affecting the well-being of those people. They, all, they further elaborate to say it's a powerful vehicle for bringing about environmental and behavioral changes that will improve the health of the community and members. Um, it involves resources, influencing systems, creating relationships among partners, and catalyzing changing of policies, programs, and practices. So I think the two themes in there are, just, is, are that it's a process and it involves achieving a specific aim, whether that is a health goal or economic goal or a housing goal or an environmental goal. Yeah, I think um, another thing I get from those definitions is just how broad community engagement and public participation can be um, in really any jurisdiction or entity or business can do a number of things and say that they're doing community engagement um, because it really is kind of a catch-all of how to talk and bring people together and you could have different reasons why you're bringing them together. Um, so it looks different in a lot of um, different ways. Uh, as we were preparing for this episode, uh, I thought about um, something that comes up in very much intro to planning um, as I learned about it in uh, undergrad is uh, Sherry Ar Arnstein's Ladder of Citizen Participation. Um, and this is important because it kind of breaks down some of what I mentioned. P public participation can be so broad, but what are the different variations of what it looks like? So if you can imagine a ladder right now climbing up um, the bottom of the ladder starts with the group of non-participation. The middle of that ladder is what is considered tokenism. And the top ladder is citizen control. And so at the very bottom, you have very much one-sided flows of information from businesses or um, governments where um, they're just putting issues out there, um, but trying to just educate or feeling like there's a need to fix those who are participating. Um, and then when you move up to tokenism, 
just kind of doing things for the representation of it, you're informing the public and it's a start, but a lot of times that information flow is only one-sided. So it doesn't actually give people an opportunity to influence or really change. Um, we, you see that influence and change at the very top of the ladder, which is citizen control. And some of those terms that aren't being used back in 1969 was partnership, delegation, citizen control. And these are a lot of things that still come up today. Manipulation is one that speaks to me a lot because as the CDC's definition elaborates, the goal of community engagement is often to influence behavioral change. Um, and if you're, as a government, trying to manipulate people into a behavioral change, when you really should be working with them to change the context in which that behavior thrives. And so manipulation, a, a good example to me might be the constant reminder of black on black crime data when talking about just threats to black people or racism among racism against African Americans and how that's kind of used as an idea to say, oh well, if you would stop committing crimes against each other, then maybe crimes wouldn't happen to you in general. Trying to manipulate people into changing a behavior when really you're ignoring the general context in which crime and activity happens. Right, and I think if community engagement and public participation, I think it's usually seen to help the community when really the root of it is to control those behaviors in a way that the government is is seeking to control their citizens, which is not democracy defined. I would not, <laughs> I would not think it is. Um, however, the federal government does have a lot of mandates for why there needs to be community engagement in the first place um, and certain requirements around it. Um, and it, go, it can really branch off into a lot of different areas, um, even stretching as far to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, we think about the right to vote, the right to freedom of speech, um, the right to freedom of assembly and association. Um, so some of that being like to, peaceful, to peacefully protest, um, the right to have associations and join um, are all things that are considered part of a democracy. Another piece of why government um, requires certain levels of community engagement and feedback, there are open meeting laws also known as sunshine laws that require meetings for federal, state, and local governments to be open to the public. And they also have to post the, any decisions or records that they make. And so with that, there may also be public comment and public hearing requirements that come along with posting openly those decisions and records. Um, and another part of the public decision process, as I mentioned, um, this may take the place in the form of public hearings, writing comments, um, creating planning and zoning commissions, um, having advisory committees and task force, um, all ways to engage the public in uh, different ways. But these opportunities seem really formal. So how do you really communicate with the public who might not be in certain positions or who might not resent, who might not represent certain geographies? Um, a lot of times when these things are being presented, they're already proposed, they've already been decided, they've already been talked about in many committees. And so then the public is just left to react rather than have any sort of partnership. Um, another form of uh, federal requirements to engage the public is through environmental reviews and NEPA. And why am I blanking? The national, <laughs> what does NEPA stand for again? The National Environmental Policy Act. I was like, I know Jasmine knows. I, I'm forgetting though. Um, so some of their public participation requirements, and we'll have all of this in the show notes for your um, viewing and reading pleasure. Um, but some of those laws require them to use plain language, to give notice and ensure meaningful participation. And that has its own, its whole definition of what meaningful participation looks like. Um, also using 30 days uh, um, in advance before decisions to have a public comment, comment period. And then depending on the project, there may be specific requirements to involve communities where health, there could be potential health impacts as a result of the project and how it affects the environment, um, especially for lower income populations, um, for people of color or those who live on tribal reservations. 
Um, and they say that public participation is one of the ways to determine the effectiveness of an environmental review or an environmental impact assessment. Um, but again, a lot of these pro a lot of these processes are usually very formal um, and maybe limiting to who can get involved. Nima, I think you bring up a good point in talking about not only the universal human rights and then drilling down into NEPA because there are various levels, like we mentioned, of a citizen being involved. Is your involvement a protest? Is your involvement um, submitting a comment to a public meeting? Is your involvement maybe presenting data that you've done your own research on if you are um, a professor or a scholar in a particular field and that matter is coming up. So there's various ways in which you as a citizen can involve yourself in the various um, forms of democracy because the general theme of this episode is that community engagement is your civic duty and your opportunity to engage in a democracy. And I was trying to find a quote earlier, but there's some quote out there about how we don't have a democracy unless people are engaged and people participate in the democracy. There are several requirements to community engagement, um, like Nemo, Nemo mentioned, the sunshine laws, but then all of most cities and towns and states have their own version of a planning code or a planning act and that might um, force the entity, the planning department or the city council to hold that public meeting to receive those comments. And so when those opportunities are available, that's actively allowing citizens to say, here's your time to let us know your thoughts on these issues. And if no one shows up, if no one makes any comments, then you are leaving the judgment to the hand of the elected official or the appointed representative of your general jurisdiction. And while you might have elected them, or maybe you didn't elect them, you can always share with them in a public forum your opinions on the topic at hand or the issue at hand. Yeah, I think, you know, you definitely, um, you can, it's a choice, you know, to, like you said, to be active and participate to make it a democracy. Um, but you can deserve, you can demand what you deserve and the things you want, you know, I'm trying to think of an example where, you know, you work closely, you know, you work closely with somebody in an organization, you know, maybe it's a nonprofit that you volunteer with, or even I think about back in school, like whether maybe it's like a club and you do elections to elect your club president or something, um, you don't just elect them as cl club president and then never expect to see them or hear from them again. You're like, when's our next meeting? What, what are we doing? What's our, what's our volunteer opportunities? What events are we hosting for the, for the campus? Um, you have expectations of them and you want to see it and you want to like feel it and know that it's happening because you're like, I voted for you. Um, and so I think we can definitely keep that same energy with people who are making a lot of decisions that affect our lives. And so Nemo, if, someone is looking to be more involved in their community, either as an individual or as a group, what kind of strategies can they look towards? Yeah, so we're going to definitely spend time later on in this episode talking about how these strategies can be better. But definitely, if you're just starting from scratch and wanting, wanting to just know background on how to inform yourself about what's going on in your community and using that then information to inform any comments or public feedback that you give. Um, I'll uh, add this in the show notes, but the um, US Department of Housing and Urban Development has a good portal that um, has links depending on the state or region that you're in um, that pulls a lot of data that you can use to inform um, once you do become engaged. Um, but one of the first steps definitely is to attend a public meeting. Um, you can definitely get a feel of what's being discussed. And then in that public meeting, depending on what, what the um, meeting is for, you can volunteer to sign up and provide your own ideas and your own feedback. Um, you can participate in surveys or focus groups. Um, a lot of uh, um, local governments or organizations will post links where you can take, so there's always a survey going on at any time. So that's definitely one way, um, but you can then pull that information together. You can work with neighbors. Um, you can uh, distribute, you can distribute resources in that way, um, make phone calls, do further outreach. 
Um, you can serve on an advisory committee. Um, I know um, certain jurisdictions to be on an advisory committee under the government, it could really just be as simple as seeing an opening, applying, submitting your resume, um, answering a few brief questions about what you do in your current role, what your, you know, what types of things you're involved with. Um, but I know that those committees are likely actively looking for people to get involved. Um, and so I mean, I talked about volunteering a few times. Um, and so whether, uh, you know, a plan or a long range plan is in the process of being um, done in a, in a local jurisdiction and a long range plan um, is typically um, it could be 20 to 25 years out that really looks at all the aspects of a city, whether that's land use, transportation, housing, um, the planning department of that town is responsible for looking to the outlook to what that could be, but it's really important that they get a lot of feedback in the process. And so um, that's a key way to, that's kind of always kind of going on because they do the plan and there's always updates. Um, so definitely engaging in that process and the planning process. And finding those opportunities might seem daunting, but thanks to social media and the internet, it actually makes it much easier if you have access to those things. I personally follow all of the city council pages and the planning board pages and, and just the general city um, Instagram page and Twitter page so that whenever I see something posted, a survey, um, a focus group opportunity, I can see it on my timeline and choose to engage. I don't have to actively seek out the information by clicking follow on say the MTA's um, Twitter page or city of Atlanta's Twitter page or city of Atlanta city council Twitter page. Whenever they tweet, it comes up on my timeline thanks to the algorithm. And I can know, okay, they're doing a focus group on future bus stations for MARTA. And I can say, you know, I care about MARTA. I'm going to do the survey or I'll send it to someone who I know that lives in Atlanta and I'll have them fill out the survey. Um, and so choosing to follow their social media pages is a good way to passively stay involved without having to seek out the opportunities. Um, and if you join a large organization, so you don't have to start one for your own neighborhood, there may already be community-based organizations in which you can just be a member. You don't have to be the leader of the organization or on the board. And as a member, you'll get their emails and their group me messages to let you know, hey, we're doing a petition against XYZ initiative. Hey, we're doing a food drive for this initiative. And you as a member can just say, I'm going to donate my time. I'm going to donate my money and I can be involved in my community because they might, there's power in numbers, right? And so if you're already in an organization, when it's time to go to one of those public meetings, I'm not going to say you're more reputable because you as a citizen, you as a renter, as a homeowner, are reputable by yourself, but when there's power in numbers, it shows your elected officials and there can shows them that their constituents as a whole, larger numbers are concerned about a particular issue or matter. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. Those are great ways to stay engaged. I think uh, COVID has forced people to get really creative about ways to engage um, online and virtually. Um, and still collect a lot of really important feedback. Um, and so, as Jasmine mentioned, you may have a particular stance on something. When you group with other people, you may feel that it creates more of a difference. But rather than working individually, you might feel really passionately, passionately about something and present that and then find out, oh, no one else who's speaking at this public meeting feels the way I do. Does that mean my voice doesn't matter? And it's like, no, it does. It's probably just that there are 10 other people who didn't know the meeting was going on. Um, and so definitely forming those forming those bonds um, with existing groups makes a lot makes a difference. Nemo brought up a good point about COVID in that a lot of public meetings happened in person prior to March 2020 when the world restarted. Um, now a lot of those meetings are online. And so I've actually been able to attend more public meetings now that they're online because I don't have to drive downtown to sit in a conference room and attend a meeting. I can do it at my desk while I'm at work, when I'm running or at the gym, and I can 
gather the information. And you can also submit your comments um, either by leaving a voicemail on like a general 800 number for your city, or you can tweet during the meeting. Um, and that is other ways for you to be involved other than just showing up physically in person. So now that we've given you some quick ways to be involved, we're going to run through some scenarios because this, this is a how-to episode. And so we want to make sure that it's informative and useful for all of our listeners. And so there are various ways, not only ways to be involved, but various activities that kind of trigger the need for quote-unquote community engagement. And so there are activities that are project-based, for example, a new bike lane, a new bridge, um, a new bus route, a new train line. Those are city-based or government-based activities that trigger the need to engage the community to get their opinions on this particular project. But then there are also legislative matters that also require community engagement. And so I'm gonna run through, and Nemo's gonna run through a few project-based and legislation-based examples. And so, because I used to work for a planning office, I'm gonna talk about a planning variance. And so, not to go too much into the weeds, but mostly every state in America has some version of a planning act or a planning code. It basically establishes the need and authorizes planning activities to happen across the state. And in that planning and zoning law, there is a requirement for a planning department, which also has a planning board. The planning board is usually appointed community members that sit on a board, maybe there's like eight to 10 of them, and they review applications for development. What they're actually reviewing are people's applications to the zoning ordinance. We talked about zoning multiple times in this in this podcast, mostly as it relates to exclusion, exclusionary zoning or trying to exclude a certain demographic or type of person. And so engagement in the planning process at the very local level might look like someone trying to build something in a neighborhood that triggers what they call a variance, meaning they're trying to build a single family home in an area that's zoned for commercial properties. They're trying to build a three-story house in an area that's zoned for two stories. Or what's most common is they're trying to build a house and it's too close, quote unquote, to the street. The zoning ordinance says you have to be 10 feet from the sidewalk and they wanna build the house only at eight feet. So their application is gonna trigger what they call a variance. You wanna vary from what the zoning ordinance has and that requires a special approval. Now, when that happens, all of the people who live in a particular distance, it might be 100 feet, maybe it's a half a mile, maybe it's a quarter mile, that varies by municipality, get a letter in the mail saying, hey, look, this particular site is applying for XYZ variants, and we're having a meeting on this date and this time for you to come voice your opinions. That is a clear opportunity, a perfect invite for you to bring your voice to the table and say how you feel about this matter. If you don't particularly care, you don't have to go to the meeting. If it's something that maybe you're the neighbor and now their house is going to be too close to yours or you don't want to live next to a commercial building in your single family house. Um, most of the times, variances are denied if there's a there's no really good reason why you have to have that variance. They're mostly approved when the site creates some type of negative condition that prohibits the person from building according to the zoning ordinance. And I just want to bring up that this is often the zoning uh, variance is often where neighborhoods use community engagement for bad. And we're going to talk about this more in um, kind of the critiques of community engagement. But a perfect example is affordable housing. Oftentimes, the sites are too small to abide by every single zoning variance. Maybe they have to get a, a, a variance on the parking. 
this is when community members who are against apartments, who are against rental units, who are against affordable housing, who might be against senior housing, try to attend the meetings in large groups and rally against this affordable housing unit, not because of the variance, but because it's affordable housing, but because the site is requiring a variance, it creates an opportunity to tear down an otherwise sensible development idea. Yeah, I know we mentioned that we're going to get into it a little bit later, but yeah, I think it will. Yeah, I think that process alone um, and how homeowners engage with their local government um, is really telling because um, if someone has a, one type of interaction with their local government as it re relates to their property, that might fire them up to be engaged with a lot of other issues too. Um, uh, whereas maybe someone who's renting um, doesn't have to engage with their local government for that particular service or have to rely on them to like really influence what they're going to do with something that they feel is theirs. Um, so, And renters don't get those letters so if you rent in a building your landlord will get the letter um and it's up to him or her your property management company to notify all the residents but oftentimes that landlord's going to be the one attending the meeting and he might he or she might not share the information with the tenants another example of an engagement process is legislation. And this is not exactly that you're going to vote at the polls on a particular matter, but more so that your city council, you, the people that you elected to represent your ward or your district or your jurisdiction are going to vote on a matter. And this is very important that you attend these city council meetings because they cover a whole host of topics that include projects and legislation. They might be voting on a change to the zoning ordinance or the sale of city owned land or offering tax exemptions for businesses or designating historic landmarks. And the agenda is typically posted maybe 24 to 48 hours before the meeting is held. And you can submit your comments to an email account or a phone number or a Twitter page or a Facebook page in advance. Or you can always write a letter to the city council members and that they will read out loud so it's on the public record. And when this is really where strength in numbers happens, the more people you have to show up against or for a particular matter, because city council people are directly elected by their constituents. And so if you know your city council person, X person is gonna be voting on a matter, you can coordinate and communicate with that person directly and let them know how their constituents feel about an issue because elected officials care about getting reelected. Right, exactly. And if you're not able to hold them accountable due to lack of information or lack of access to how to get that information, um, then, they can really serve the populations that they know like, okay, these are the people who are going to vote for me again. So another example, um, and this one is more project based of how a scenario can go um, in terms of the ways that um, entities engage the public and being required to do so. Um, and do they just fulfill the mandate or do they go above and beyond and they do and then do they do it in an equitable way. Um, so in October of this year, um, Sound Transit, Light Rail in Seattle opened up three new light rail stations in Seattle. And so um, this was definitely a big deal. It expanded a lot of connections in certain neighborhoods of Seattle, um, maybe where people had to take multiple buses to get to a place. Now maybe they can go to a park and ride or just take um, or literally just have the light rail stop be outside of their home. And so um, speaking of that and what goes around the light rail, one of the stations that opened Roosevelt, they had a community engagement plan for transit oriented development, also known as TOD. So they wanted a community engagement to determine what would be built around the site. And so that community engagement plan called for a public survey, two public open houses and a three part stakeholder workshop series. Um, but before any of that happened, Sound Transit 
collaborated with the Roosevelt Neighborhood Association. So we talked a little bit earlier about the strength in numbers and who has the influence. Um, so they partnered with the Roosevelt Neighborhood Association, and also the city of Seattle to create the community engagement approach um, to inform both the development principles that Sound Transit would use around the station and to guide its request for proposals or RFP for the transit oriented development project. But before any of that, the same association, the Roosevelt Neighborhood Association, hosted a land use academy, which was a series of seminars on land use issues to inform residents on public land use and how development processes work. And so this series of educational uh, sessions um, informed uh, both what Seattle was currently doing for affordable housing, other transit oriented development sites that Sound Transit has been a part of, um, and then other topics surrounding real estate development. As I mentioned, the part of the engagement plan called for a three part stakeholder workshop series. The stakeholder workshop series ultimately was what determined what would go in the what would go in the transit oriented development project. And what is interesting is that the stakeholders, the 16 different groups, stakeholder groups that were identified were identified by the Roosevelt Neighborhood Association. Who was in that association and who were they picking? I'm sure they had a lot of thought. I'm sure they were very intentional about who they picked, but that's a lot of power there where they really got to influence who was going to be making these decisions for that neighborhood. And I could see as someone who's familiar with that area of Seattle, you could live in that Roosevelt neighborhood, but never have any interaction with the Roosevelt Neighborhood Association. And again, most of the times it is homeowners who have been invested in the city for decades that make up these associations, but that does not make the needs of newer residents or renters or transient residents, that does not make their needs less important. I think that what you highlighted in the beginning in terms of going above and beyond the regulation was critical because they had workshops, uh, university trainings, um, different public engagement. And I'm sure the legislation probably just said public meeting and they could open have house. had <laughs> open house. They could have had one open house, one public meeting and called it a day. No matter how many comments they got, they could have got 17 comments. That's our public engagement. Our hands are done. We made up our mind. We're moving forward. But the fact that they took the time to engage with neighbor associations, however great that that may be, was definitely telling of how much they did try, at least, to really gauge the community. And I think that's exceptional. Yeah, I think Sound Transit is doing a pretty good job of their community outreach process. I remember when I was back in um, community college in Washington State, and we were probably 10 years away from a potential light rail station, but I remember going to uh, those meetings that they hosted at the community college, a lot of student input, um, a lot of visuals, um, and then going through the process of adding my public comment um, and getting followed up, like having follow-ups, continuing to be on their email list just from that one meeting about, hey, this is what's going on. Do you want to stay engaged? Um, so I think they're definitely diligent in that way. Um, and so we're kind of coming to the end of our uh, how-to section. Um, we hope that's kind of given an insight on what it can look like. So even just, you know, looking outside, what is the development that's going on around your neighborhood and how can you be a part of that process? There's opportunities for community development, community engagement <laughs> at nearly every stage, um, community engagement, development, whatever. <laughs> um, there's community opportunities. Community engagement is very much related to community development because how can you develop a strong community without engaging them and what their needs and desires for their community are so you had it right you was right I did I did and that was my initial uh that was my initial concentration I was so inspired I always say I'm inspired by how people connect in their built and natural environments that's my that's my tagline <laughs> don't take it y'all um so some of the things that we've mentioned uh, as we do, they, it could be better. I think there are places and jurisdictions and people who are making sure that people are getting into the public participation and governance process um, as best as they can, but there are, there are opportunities to improve moving forward. 
I think the first opportunity to improve is increasing the mandate and the legislation for community engagement so that it's more than just we send a letter out to all of the property owners in half a mile maybe they'll come maybe they won't so it's more that more than okay we're going to post on our website that nobody goes to to say that we're having a public meeting on this date maybe they'll come maybe they won't i would like to see some level of requiring a certain percentage of the population to attend the meeting in order for it to qualify as community engagement. I was an RA in college and we had to host programs every maybe two months we had to host a program. And if nobody came, we didn't host a program. We didn't get points for hosting an event that nobody came to. We had to have at least 5% of our residents at the program in order for it to qualify as part of our, you know, checklist requirements. I'd like to see a similar version of that on the government side. Ooh, y'all had all that to do. <laughs> I wasn't the best RA, right, but yes, we had all of that to do. <laughs> oh, wow. Because I remember they would be begging people to come. Uh, and uh, I'm like, yeah, yeah, if I have time. Um, so that's interesting. That's funny. Yeah, no, but I think that same energy should be should be applied. Um, and uh, really taking the next step to treat the community as the expert and see them as, you know, as a valued member and someone that you want to learn from. Basically, the neighborhood is the TED Talk. You want to hear what they have to say. You want to know what their thoughts are. And that is what's going to inform the choices you make in the community moving forward. Um, you know, there it, it varies whether the people making the planning decisions or development or design decisions actually live and reside in the community where they're making those decisions. So that just makes it even that much more important that the community is driving that. Um, and then also, I think understanding the cultural makeup of the of the neighborhood and being very sensitive and aware of that um, and knowing the demographics. You know, is it a particular, is it a town where a particular amount of residents are older adults? Do a particular amount of residents not speak English as a first language? How do you include them in the process too? And sometimes it's not always just creating uh, uh, materials in different languages. I think that's the first step, but like Jasmine said, are you posting those materials on the website that nobody's going to? And if so, is that really being inclusive? And is that really engaging the community? Because of the work that I used to do in planning, I know that people who are disabled often have a very difficult time engaging in these meetings because there's often not a translator um, or someone there doing sign language, or there might be um, difficulty in comprehension and things and so making sure that at your public meetings you have someone there who can translate or who can do sign language to ensure that everyone in your community has access to it because you might be isolating someone who actually cares about the issue from attending just because you don't have services there to accommodate their needs right um, and I think as we talk about ways to make community engagement better, Jasmine kind of touched on this earlier about when community engagement can be used for intentionally or unintentionally um, delay or sway the process or a project. Um, and, uh, you know, I think about certain transportation projects that um may change the design of a street and yes the public should have a say and state their opinions on how it should look in their neighborhood but if it's a hundred different people with a hundred different design ideas maybe the transportation expert who has the, the accurate calculation of what the result of this design change will be that can also still hold some weight and move the project forward, but continuously taking different types of feedback that delay projects for years on end, while residents are still complaining that this street is not safe, does not make public engagement 
the best tool. Um, it, it takes away from the productivity of it. Yeah, and I think Mimo is highlighting something that happens just with the government and bureaucracy just in general, and that you can place so many barriers in front of the end goal. Um, not to say that community engagement is not important. Of course, it's important we're doing this whole episode, but that something as simple as saying we are going to decrease the width of this travel lane and add a bike lane should not trigger such a long and arduous process so much so that we never get the bike lane meanwhile our number of cyclists continue to increase in the city yeah and I think any um advice I would have for listeners would be to think back to the um, ladder of citizen participation that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, And, uh, you know, if the government is giving you an idea or proposal that's basically finished um, and is asking for, and basically just informing you about what, you know, what the plan already is, if people are coming back then it's still not really a two-way street because then people are just coming back and informing the government about what their opinions are. But there's still no participation. Both individuals are going back to their separate places to work on separate things and then coming back. But there's still no no true deliberation or process of working together. So I think for issues that are really sensitive or affect different groups of people, I would suggest anyone who's getting involved to really push for not just a um, top tier or low tier level of engagement, but to really require this level of participation where the residents have more, um, have more, have more of an input and a say, and it's more of a consultation back and forth rather than just both sides communicating on a one-way street. And I think that's a perfect segue as to some motivation because you may engage with your elected officials or your planning board or the transportation department or any entity and present ideas you may come with a petition with 5,000 signatures and you may have t-shirts and everything you need to present your ideas and ask them to vote in a particular way and they may still choose to vote in a different way I want to offer not to be discouraged um and if you don't win that battle to continuously fight for the next time that something comes up or the following time that a matter arises and that you can't allow yourself to be discouraged simply because the way that you wanted an outcome to arise didn't materialize in that manner and then from the perspective of an elected official if we have any listening listen to your constituents and if they are voicing a concern they've took the time to organize and present a united front then you should really take heed into what they're saying and consider how larger than just if you're going to get reelected, but really consider how this is going to impact your neighborhood and physically and and behavior wise as well Yeah, I think those are both great points to see really all the different angles of uh, um, how having a voice matters. And it really goes back to it is your human right. Um, And so definitely taking advantage of that as many opportunities as possible. Um, So we hope this how to episode on community engagement has been helpful. We look forward to bringing more how to informational um, episodes this season. We drop episodes every other Tuesday and you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at the number four degrees pod. Um, You can check out the show notes, send us an email, your thoughts, um, and we look forward to connecting with you all. Peace out, y'all.